Locked and loaded in the Brian Laundry manhunt, agents with long guns moving in. Is it a break in the case? And if you're out there giving Brian three squares and a place to stay, you might want to think twice. Tonight, I'll break down the law behind harboring a fugitive and how long any friend of Brian's who's doing that could expect to be locked up. Plus, an exclusive interview with the artist who is paying tribute to Gabby Petito in her very own hometown. And 12 years since Brittany Murphy was discovered dead on her bathroom floor, the case still confounds. Now, HBO is bringing her back to life. It's all ahead tonight on Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. We have several developments in the manhunt for Brian Laundry. Police tape across the entrance to the reserve where the FBI is searching for him. It has never been blocked off like that before. The reserve has already been closed to the public for weeks, so why the tape now? Could it have something to do with these guys who moved into the park with covered faces, dressed in camo, carrying long guns, trigger fingers on the ready? We're going to ask News Nation's Brian Enton, who is staked out at the Laundry family home in Northport. But first, a tribute to Gabby Petito, going up in her hometown of Blue Point, New York. The artist behind the mural, Tess Parker, gave an exclusive interview to Banfield today about why she felt so compelled to create this lasting memorial to Gabby Petito. We are in Blue Point on the side of the law office building here. Uh, Patricia Blair has graciously donated her building. Um, that's kind of how this all started was I uh, I'd spoken with the Schmidt and Petito family and um, so before I got the ball rolling, I obviously wanted to make sure it was something they were on board with and what it's something that they'd want. So I let them know I'm a local muralist here in the South Shore of Long Island. I grew up in East Islip, lived in Oakdale for years and have many, many friends in the community here at Bayport Blue Point. Uh, the family had chosen the quote, she touched the world. Um, that's kind of been something that they've they've been saying for a few weeks now in her honor. These are going to be two uh, different views of Earth, two different vantage points of Earth. Um, and then in the feathers, I'm going to incorporate aspects of Gabby's own artwork into it. I'm going to um, copy it from images and uh, well, do my best to do it justice. I'm a very like kind of messy painter and she did these incredible line work like Zentangle and mandala work so we'll see if I can uh, <laughs> if I can mimic it I'll try my best Gabby <laughs> and um, then there's going to be sunflowers uh, there's going to be butterflies yeah I'm just going to make it from that image when I heard about the case I began following it um, I had friends tell me about it because it's it's local around here. Um, it's something I would have known about regardless. And I think it's just something that's so tragic and something that could have been prevented had it been handled a little bit better in Wyoming or Utah rather, and maybe even in Wyoming too, because there's so much we don't know. There really is so much that we don't know. Um, and a large part of that is because she was taken from us. You heard her say there are so many things we don't know in this case. Fortunately, we're joined by a person who has always had the answers for us. News Nation's Brian Enton is staked out, as usual, outside of the laundry home. So first, just uh, the, the, the focus um, changing over, Brian, from, you know, the, the manhunt. You know, we forget there is a beautiful woman who's gone and there are a lot of people grieving. 
Yeah, I'm so glad that you played that entire thing, Ashley, and that you got that interview because, you know, I'm so immersed in the manhunt. I'm guilty of it, too, because I'm following every little lead throughout the entire day. But at the end of the day, this is um, about Gabby Petito, and that is what that mural should be all about. Um, and the fact that they're going to help shine a light on domestic violence and uh, uh, really an epidemic throughout our entire country is going to do so much good uh, in the decades ahead. You know, um, Gabby's parents, all four of them, still in Wyoming, you know, they headed out there to uh, get her remains. And they, wow, her dad tweeted something today that just, you know, heart thud when you saw the picture. Um, talk about what he sent out to his followers. Yeah, so he took a picture um, from Wyoming where he is, uh, with with his wife Gabby's stepmom, and then also uh, Gabby's mom and her husband Gabby's stepdad, picked, uh, sent out this beautiful, beautiful picture uh, of the mountains and a lake, uh, and basically said that they love and miss Gabby, and they now know uh, why she loved that place so much. Yeah, that also just adding that this was important for them, uh, for for Gabby to be in the wind. I thought that was something quite significant um, in terms of would she be buried there? Would she be buried in, in uh, Long Island? And Joe said, you know, she don't want to be buried. She wants to be in the wind. It just seems very beautiful that it would be at that very halcyon location. Listen, it affects everybody, right, who follows this story. For whatever reason, we were transfixed by Princess Diana. We were, we've been transfixed along the way by people who've met a, a very unjust end. And to, to that end, some of those protesters who show up there don't just cross Northport or don't just come from places in Florida. Brian, they come from a long way away. Yeah, they really do. Uh, and many of them have stories that they don't want to talk about on camera, and I'll just sort of talk to them out here on the street. Others want to share their story, and they want us to put them on the news so that they can get the word out. And there were these two sisters today uh, that came from Minnesota. They flew here all the way from Minnesota. Let me show you what they brought with them, Ashley. This sign right here, this yellow sign, what if it was Cassie? That is a sign that they put right here in the lawn facing the laundry's house. And I had a chance to speak uh, with one of the sisters who explained to me, and it was a heart-wrenching story, um, that she is a victim of domestic violence. And she went through so much, and she feels such a connection to this case that she came all the way here to Florida uh, from Minnesota. Listen to what she had to say. I needed to be here for Gabby, basically, because I know what she went through. I know what she went through emotionally, mentally, uh, financially. I know exactly what she went through. She wasn't able to leave. He used all her fears against her while they were out. I mean, he kicks her out of the van and then hangs her backpack on the mirror. That's classic. I've had that done. He, he probably told her he was going to leave her there. I, my old relationship, I almost got left in Los Angeles. I almost got left in Wyoming. I almost got left in South Dakota. Um, and I literally would have to beg, like, no, don't leave me here. You can't leave me here, you know. And um, that's what he was doing to her with that whole kicking her out of the van and putting her backpack on the mirror. And I know how she was feeling. And this is, I feel like I just had to be here. <laughs> it's a very, it kills your soul, is what it does. It kills your soul. And she was there, I could see it in her face. She felt helpless. It just breaks my heart for her. When you say she was helpless, are you talking about the body camera video? Did you see that with yeah, the incident? Yeah, that's, that's, I saw it and I knew right away. I knew right away. Um, the cop was like, well, he said to Brian, well, technically, you're, you're a victim of domestic abuse. And he got cocky about it. He got cocky about it, like, oh, yeah, I am, aren't I? She abused me. Yeah, he's the victim. Yeah, he's the victim. No, no, he's not the victim. She's the victim. 
I was so touched by her story. Um, and again, it is just showing the way that Gabby's story is re resonating with so many people and women from around the country. I mean, Ashley, after we were done on camera, I talked to her and she basically walked me through that body camera video. There were so many things that she saw in that video, things that I didn't even notice that she noticed uh, because of her own past. It's just uh, remarkable, and I think there are, you know, Gabby Petito reaches people for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we have journeyed with her, the video, the elements that are, exist for us to have sort of gotten to know her. Uh, it's very different than just a static photograph. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about that business at the reserve today. We saw all these people armed to the hilt and also masked, like as though they were undercover and did not want to be wrecking. I mean, look at the guy in the front. He isn't just wearing a face mask. He's covering his whole face up. Uh, who were these guys? Yeah, so this was interesting. We didn't see this coming at all. We heard there was action at the reserve. We raced over there. Uh, and then you had these guys basically in tactical gear, in camo, faces covered, as you mentioned, and assault rifles. They were even like running around at one point in and out of the swamp right uh, off of the street where we, we were. It was, you know, we were wondering what is going on? Is this a sign of something? Uh, we later talked to Northport police. They confirmed these were Northport police officers, a part of one of their tactical units. They say they were participating in the search for Brian Laundrie, but an important point they made, they said this was also part of a training exercise, uh, and that's why we saw these guys out there sort of acting the way they were. Yeah, Twitter went kind of, uh, it almost broke with, with people saying, why would they train anywhere where there's an active crime scene potentially and a uh, search for a fugitive, a federal uh, warranted fugitive. It just said, it seemed odd to even our law enforcement friends. And then to, just to highlight, it looks lovely, like a nice walk in some tall grass, but Brian, it's not. It's muddy, it's awful. They, even their vehicles got stuck. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's muddy, it's, it's swampy, there's, you know, a lot of puddles, and you, I mean, yeah, there was this moment where they came in this white van, um, they got stuck in the mud, they weren't even able to get the van out when they were trying to leave, which kind of shows you the conditions uh, that were happening there. But it was very strange that they would be doing a training. There was one former FBI agent who I spoke to uh, who basically said in her entire career, uh, almost three decades, she has never heard of doing a training when you think there could be uh, a murderer on the loose in the area. To her, she said that just didn't add up. And the other thing that I thought of that was weird is like they know the media, they know we're out there every day watching. So like I would have thought almost like we would have gotten some kind of warning like, hey, if you see these guys in the tactical gear, right. that is just a training. <laughs> um, so all of it was, was different, yeah. Yeah, that just sort of made very little sense to me. And I have to admit, Brian, I didn't realize that the van that was stuck was one of those white vans. Um, that was a little jarring for a moment because it looked a lot like Gabby, uh, Gabby's white transit van when I saw that video. I just thought, oh God, is this, you know, the, the Petitos talk about a sign, but my goodness, that was a little disconcerting at first to see these guys pushing that van, um, a white van uh, stuck in the mud there. Holy cow. Brian, there was another thing you noticed today. The laundries don't make a lot of public appearances. They barely leave that bungalow, but they did today. Mr. Laundry was doing some construction on the front door. What was, what was he doing? So let me walk you over to the door. Um, if you look on the screen now, you'll see just to the right of the screened in door, there is now a little ring camera there. That was not there. So basically, uh, my cameraman Luis and I, we were over at the reserve. We had a, a photographer here covering the house for us in case anything happened. He calls me and he says, um, Christopher Laundry has come out with a drill with an electric drill and power tools and is doing something in front of the house. And I'm like, okay, what is going on? So we come back here. Uh, it turns out he was installing that ring camera on the screen door. Uh, I reached out to Mr. Bertolino for, for clarity. Was this possibly because of, you know, death threats or what sort of caused this all of a sudden? He said to his knowledge, and Mr. Bertolino, by the way, is the laundry family attorney, to his knowledge, uh, he didn't know of any death threats that they received. We know these protests are planned for tomorrow, but it was certainly an interesting development to see him outside doing that. 
Yeah, and as we just go to break, you said protests are planned for tomorrow, something more than usual. While you're telling me about that, can you and Luis walk back over to that spot where the ladies from Minnesota put up that uh, that sign about what if it was Cassie, your daughter? Because last night you showed me another sign. I just wanted to make sure I was seeing that it's still there. Yeah, so this sign is still here, and I know why you're checking, because in the past, the laundries have come out in the middle of the night and removed signs. But this sign is still here that says, remember me, uh, with the picture of Gabby. Now we've got this new one, what if, uh, what if it was Cassie, obviously trying to send a message to the laundries. And then tomorrow, we're not sure you know, what tomorrow will bring with, with this planned protest uh, in the afternoon. Brian, my Twitter is going crazy again. People have so many questions for you. I bet if you just take a peek at your phone, you'll see that your Twitter is as well. So will you come back in a bit, um, do some uh, Q&A again? It was great last night. You answered a lot of people's uh, questions, but they have more. Are you, are you free in a bit? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll be here. Okay, excellent. Brian, thank you for that. Uh, he'll be back, like I said, uh, a little bit later uh, to answer your questions. You can still tweet them to us, too, using the handles at TV Ashley, it's L-E-I-G-H, um, and also at Brian Enton. Uh, now, here's a thought. Brian Laundry at this point, is wanted only for debit card fraud. Would you believe he just may have something in common with John Dillinger? I am not kidding. How is it possible? I'm going to show you how it's possible next. Welcome back. You know, this week, if you were watching, uh, we had Joel Lambert on the show. I love him. Um, he's the former Navy SEAL who's an expert in escaping and evading and building beautiful fires. So this is what Joel did. He went ahead and he asked his 16,000 Twitter followers, where did they think Brian Laundrie's hiding out? And here is what his followers said. 26% of them said they think Laundrie is dead Six and a half percent think he's in that swamp, you know, Florida wilderness, somewhere. Nine percent, only nine percent think he's on the Appalachian Trail. But a full 64 percent think that he is in someone's house in an urban area. Now, please keep in mind that these respondents don't know any more about Brian Laundrie's whereabouts than you or I do. But you know what? It certainly gets you thinking, doesn't it? If Laundrie is enjoying the hospitality of a friend or a family member, those people could be in for some big trouble. Before the break, I mentioned Don, John Dillinger, the notorious Depression-era bank robber, after he was killed in a shootout with G-Men in 1934. No fewer than 27 people were hauled up on charges of harboring him and his cronies. In this century, the mobster slash informant Whitey Bulger spent 16 years on the lam with his girlfriend, Catherine Gregg, uh, before they were finally caught in 2011. Catherine got eight years, eight years in prison for not turning in Whitey. It's called harboring, Catherine, and it's got to suck where you sit right now. So now I want to turn to my guest, Rich Frankel. He is a lawyer. He is a former New York prosecutor, a retired FBI special agent. Mike Chitwood is a frequent visitor to this program. He is smart. He keeps the peace in Volusia County in Florida, and he had that run on Live PD. Hello to both of you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Rich Frankel. It is no joke harboring a fugitive, whether they are federal fugitives or state fugitives. Take it from there. Correct. So you'll have both federal and state rules the federal rules are, are very strict about who is being kept. I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo in my ear. I, I, um, just one second. Oh, no, let me um, fix that. Let me fix that. Yeah, pull yeah. it out and then, yeah, that should help. Thanks. So uh, the federal issues regarding fugitives. If you are a, uh, uh, under indictment and you become a fugitive and somebody helps you and they know you're a fugitive, and during that time when they are helping you, they are doing something purposeful to keep you away from the police, keep you hidden, then they have committed a federal crime and they could be uh, prosecuted for it. Uh, many people have been prosecuted for it. You can uh, uh, be charged with a felony. You can do a year, several years, and as you said, uh, up to eight years in jail uh, on the Bolger case. Yeah, and as I understand it,
10 years uh, is the total, too. Let me just go over these. For the federal harboring statute, the arrest warrant has to be issued. Okay, so that's got to be number one in order to be, you know, hauled up on this. Uh, you have to know that the alleged harbor uh, knows that the warrant exists, right? The alleged harbor must also be concealing the fugitive with the intent of preventing or hindering uh, the arrest. So those are the things that if you're watching and you're, you know, looking out for Brian Laundry, just watch those four things because if you are part of that, you could be in big trouble, up to 10 years if the wanted person has committed or was about to commit a felony. And I think that could be proven with this uh, bank fraud. That's a, that's a felony, and that is federal. So then, Mike Chitwood, there's some state stuff, too, when it comes to um, harboring a fugitive. We're not dealing with state laws at this point for Brian Laundry, But if we were, there are 14 states that actually say if you're a family member, you're exempt from this. You can harbor your family member. That kind of sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, but it's true. Florida has some exemptions in their rules, but having worked a plethora of homicides here uh, where a family member injects himself into investigation, the normal charge that we apply down here is tampering. And that is different charge than harboring a fugitive. And they have different degrees, felony to first degree, second degree, or third degree, if we can prove that that was the case. And, and we've had that where you're headed to a house with a search warrant and the parent or the girlfriend takes evidence out of the house or they're in communication with that person and they decide they're not going to report that to us or they lie during an official investigation, that tampering charge would apply. So are you surprised, Mike Chitwood, uh, by this little fun fact? And it comes to us via, uh, via a former U.S. Marshal named Jack Clough, and that is that about 85 percent, and I'm per, forgive me for kind of snickering, 85 percent of apprehended fugitives are brought down by a girlfriend or a former girlfriend. I suppose in your business that is no surprise. It goes back to what one of your earlier uh, folks who were interviewed was a victim of domestic violence talked about. Uh, normally, it is in a domestic violence case, it's another girlfriend or former girlfriend or somebody who's abused by this guy who makes the call for us to make the arrest. You know, I wonder, Rich Frankel, if, if the, the Brian Laundries and the Mr. and Mrs. Laundries of the world know about cases like Machine Gun Kelly. I mean, I know today that's a, a kind of a rap name, but back in the day, that was not a rap name. Machine Gun Kelly is serious. He's a prohibition era gangster and bootlegger from Memphis. He was kidnapping an oil tycoon uh, and getting $200,000 worth of ransom while he had all sorts of pals helping him out. And it ended up that five people were convicted of harboring machine gun Kelly and their sentences were only one to two years. Do you know, Rich, what's kind of standard? I mean, I hear it's up to 10, but what's kind of standard if someone's out there and they've got Brian Laundry in their house or their basement? It, 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 there is no standard. It's going to go back and forth between what they did to hide him, what the intent was, and what, what the relationship is. Um, if they were just, you know, basically... Uh, you know, giving him some food, helping him out um, for a day or two, that's one thing. If they uh, had a cutout in their basement and they were, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having him stay there for a year uh, where they would keep him away from the federal authorities, that would also go into what the feds would determine um, uh, they would charge with and what the judge would use in determining the sentence. So you could have anything so, from the one year and one day, which I think was uh, uh, in several of the Machine Gun Kelly cases, up to the eight years, which was uh, in the Bolger case. It all depends on yeah. how much they've done um, and, and really what that intent was uh, to well, for, uh, protect the I gotta say, the, for any critics uh, out there, yeah, I was just going to say, for any critics out there who think there's too much TV coverage, there's a real plus to the TV coverage when it comes to harboring. And that is, if it is everywhere and it is saturating this country, it is real hard to say, I didn't know if you're the harborer, because all you have to know is that it's happening and that they're wanted and that there's a warrant. So some of this TV coverage might actually really go well towards, uh, you know, a punishment if, it, if it's happening. Hey, um, Rich and Mike, thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. I loved having you. Come back. Thank you, Ashley. You as well. Thank you very much. All right, guys, we still have a lot of questions about what could happen to someone harboring Brian Laundry. But what about the people who are protesting on Mr. and Mrs. Laundry's lawn? Could they be in trouble for that First Amendment right?
You will watch where your toes are, right? Brian Etten's coming back right after the break to answer your questions. You can still tweet us at TV Ashley and at Brian Enton. Back in a moment. Welcome back to our special coverage of the Brian Laundry manhunt. News Nation's Brian Enton is back with us live from his position outside of the Laundry family home. And you've got questions. Brian Enton's got answers. Let's start with this. Fayel asks, uh, Brian, are the Laundries going to be slapped with the search bill uh, in that swamp for their son? Uh, that's a good question. A lot of people are upset about this search because it's been so massive and expensive. We learned that it's costing more than a million dollars over the last month, just the search that's been happening at the reserve. Uh, I'm not really sure. Maybe you would know the answer to this question better than me, Ashley. Can they, can they be slapped with it? I mean, could there be some kind of civil... Well lawsuit at some point what, or something? I've seen it happen before. Right now, they are not charged with anything. So if they are, and if they're found guilty, then yeah, yeah, absolutely. State entities and civic entities can come back after them for these kinds of things. Sure, I've seen it before. So uh, this next one comes from Butterflies and Ariel. They ask, I don't think I've ever seen either of the parents getting food or working. How are they able to do that? So uh, it, we, it appears to us that they are uh, retired uh, because they don't go to work ever. In terms of food, they have gone to the grocery store a couple times that we know of over the last month, but for the most part, they get deliveries. Uh, we saw them with an Instacart delivery at one point. They've had Amazon deliveries, so they appear to be getting everything delivered to the house at this point. I will also say with that retirement thing, their business is like a juicer service. If you do a Google business search, it says temporarily closed. You click on the website and the account is suspended. Uh, you know, things aren't going well, perhaps, for the laundries. Okay, Maria asks this one, Brian. Uh, how did the laundries choose this real estate attorney from New York? Any family connection? So we know they go back decades and decades back in New York. They're longtime associates, and from what we've gathered, friends, they even may have had a business relationship, some kind of real estate business relationship at one point. So this relationship goes beyond just sort of a lawyer-client uh, relationship. They seem to be family friends for a long time. And you know what? There's nothing better than a free lawyer because that stuff racks up really fast. Um, all right. Chris has this question. It's a great one. Um, if slash when they find Brian Laundry, would the case take place in Wyoming or Florida? Which, you know, that's it. I'm going to jump in here for a second, uh, Brian, because the... Uh, body was found in Wyoming, so that should be the state jurisdiction, but it's also, I believe, within a federal park, so that could be a federal jurisdiction, but I do believe the jurisdiction probably would be there if it's murder. Uh, but there's also bank fraud, and I don't know where the allegation of bank fraud happened because he drove through a whole lot of states to get home, so that bank fraud could be in any one of those states or it could be in more if they load more of them on. So I just thought I'd throw that on because I've seen that stuff happen before. But uh, I'm going to give you this one. It's from Brent. I love this one. This is what you see all the time, Brian. Brent says, could the neighbors who have been putting signs on the laundry's lawn be charged or sued for harassment? Uh, sort of like a, a trespass, maybe, that sort of thing. It doesn't appear so. So with the protesters and the bullhorns that we saw for so long, that became an issue. The neighbors would get mad. They would call the police. There was even one weekend where the police came out with this noise measuring device and were trying to tell the protesters they were being too loud. So that was an issue. In terms of the signs uh, that we've seen out here, you notice they've really kept them on the swale which we know in news, because we're always parking on people's yards and stuff, you're sort of okay if you're on someone's swale because it's not technically their property like where we're standing right now. Uh, so it appears to us that they're going to be okay uh, doing this at this point. Uh, and, and so far the laundries have sort of left this corner of the yard uh, alone. Yeah, that's interesting that you call it the swale. I don't know that everyone knows that, but if it's uh, if that is common property, you're allowed to be there and you have a First Amendment right. You just can't be a nuisance and you can't go over certain decibels. So good one. Plus, there would have to be a complaint as well. I'm not sure the laundries really want to invite any sort of action right now. Okay, I love this one. Holly asks, are they going to have a tough time finding jurors because everyone knows about this case? First, before you answer that, Brian, I want to be really clear. Uh, the jurors right now would be for the bank fraud. Um, but if there is some kind of a, a murder case, I think then that's an issue, like serious issue about the jurors. So take it from there. 
Yeah, and you're probably more of an expert on this than I am, but from all of the trials that I've covered and when I've covered jury selection, uh, you're allowed to know about the case. Um, like the Derek Chauvin trial I covered in Minneapolis with George Floyd, a lot of those people, all of them had heard of George Floyd in the case. The issue is when you say that you would have a bias and that you can't go into it sort of with a clean slate. Um, so just because people have heard of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie doesn't mean necessarily that they couldn't be a juror. Excellent answer, Young Watson. But I'm going to add to it as well. Um, so you're right. And if I always say I have a mantra, I say if O.J. Simpson could get a fair trial in the United States of America, anyone can get a fair trial in the United States of America. And I have been proved right after Robert Blake, after Michael Jackson, after Casey Anthony. So it can happen. The fact, as Brian just said so eloquently, the fact that people know about a case, that's not it. It's finding fairness and impartiality in that voir dire process, which is so hard. And it takes months. And sometimes you've got to move to other jurisdictions to find people. OK, another question. Jill asks this one. Do you know if the police have someone watching his parents and sister just in case? So it's quiet out here tonight. You see the streets are dark. There are definitely no marked Northport police cruisers uh, out here tonight. We were at the sisters briefly this week. It was also quiet there. So we don't see anyone, but I would suspect uh, in light of them already, um, you know, sort of losing Brian Laundrie in the beginning and him still being uh, a fugitive right now, I would guess there's some kind of surveillance happening in this area. Yeah, that's that's a problem, right? I mean, if you follow, oh gosh, follow Brian's Twitter if you don't already. But if you do, people are apoplectic about the fact that you know the police chief said, "Yep, we got eyes on," and then Shazam, uh, he's you know wherever swamp, whatever. And you know, to that swamp, there's a good question from Isabel. She says this: How effective are canine units in an area like the swamp? You know, from what we've learned from all the experts, they're pretty effective. Those dogs, those dogs are really incredible um, at what they can do. Uh, their sense of smell is insane. And now that the water is receding, we're told even if items were wet, if they found Brian Laundry's clothes that had been wet or something like that, it's still possible uh, that the canines could, could detect the scent. Okay, last quick question. It's from somebody named Mabe. Uh, is it unusual that law enforcement is saying nothing, Brian, about this case? A press conference? Anything? I, and again, I want to hear your take on this, Ashley, too. But what I think is no. I mean, every federal crime I've covered that's been high profile inv involving the FBI, they've basically said nothing unless they need the media or the public's help. And in this case, you know, you've already got pretty much everyone on the lookout for Brian Laundrie. So, so I'm not really surprised that they're not talking. Yeah, hard to get stuff out of the FBI unless you have friends or you dated somebody. <laughs> they say nothing. Uh, different with local police. There's a lot of, you know, people, a lot of local reporters have sources um, on police forces, and that's why you hear law enforcement sources. But it's tricky on this one. They are real tight-lipped, and it's not like we haven't covered cases like this before where even the locals are tight-lipped as well. Brian Enton. It is Friday night. I hope you and Luis are going to go and get a drink or something and then a giant meal and have a long <laughs> sleep. Thanks, Ashley. Have a good weekend. So good to see you. Thank you, my friend. Okay, I'm going to switch gears, but only because something crossed our radar today that we just thought, what? Yeah. She was only 32 when she died, but she'd become this huge star. And she seemed to become even more famous in death. And now HBO is bringing her back to life with a brand new documentary that examines that Absolutely crazy mystery surrounding Brittany Murphy's death. Really unexplainable. That's next. She was not your typical Hollywood leading lady. Goofy, cute, funny, and gorgeous all at the same time. Brittany Murphy achieved what many in Hollywood could not. Cult film status. Just watch her movies. Clueless, Eight Mile, Girl Interrupted, Mung Few. So when she was mysteriously found dead on her bathroom floor at just 32, the conspiracy theories ran amok. Fascination over her death became obsession. And well over a decade later, it has not gone away. Just check out the new HBO Max docuseries called What Happened, Brittany Murphy? 
Murphy has died. Media at the age and paparazzi of surrounded the home that she shared with her husband Simon Monjack. Simon took her away. Joining us now is Jim Murray. He's the chief correspondent for Inside Edition, and Roger Neal. He's the former publicist for both Britney's late husband, Simon Monjack, as well as Britney's mother, Sharon Murphy. Welcome to you both. Roger, I'm going to begin with you. Have you seen this documentary, and is it accurate? I have seen it, and uh, yes, it's, um, it's pretty much accurate. I, I, uh, I'm very happy with how it, how it came out. So do we learn something new about Brittany? Because honestly, all these years later, I still don't understand how she died and how Simon died just five months later, both of them of pneumonia and severe anemia, the exact same cause. It just, for the rest of us out here uh, in reasonable land, it just doesn't sound normal. Well, you know, they lived in a house that had a lot of mold. And I know in the documentary, you'll, you'll see that mold did not, uh, according to the pathologist, have a, have a place in why they passed away. But they didn't go to the doctor. They really didn't take care of their health. Uh, and so I think that was a big contributing factor. But had you been in the home, which I was many times, uh, the mold was all over the living room, around the windows, around the doors. I mean, it was, and they lived in this 24 7. So I think it helped, I think it sort of helped their immune system go down, uh, my personal mm -hmm. opinion. And uh, I just didn't think they lived a healthy lifestyle. And I really don't think that they took care of themselves. They didn't go to the doctor like they should have. Um, and they went, you know, they sort of had a feel-good pharmacy that would take care of them. Um, and I think that was a big mistake, too. So I think there's a, 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 a few contributing factors to why that they're not here today. So one of the things, Jim Murray, that I sort of was floored by, I thought I knew everything about her. And then I learned that uh, Simon had, like, a, a secret child with someone else. And, and she never knew, but she went to her death never knowing about that. I, I found that really disturbing. Uh, it, well, there were a lot of disturbing things in the documentary. You mentioned severe anemia. And, and one of the other things that the, the toxicology report showed, multiple drug intoxication for both of them. Don't forget, they both died within five months of each other, very similar circumstances, pneumonia and, and drugs in their system. Uh, the, the, the child only underscored the aspect of Simon Monjack that most people believed to be true, and that was the suspicion that he was a con artist, that he was a Svengali type who had somehow taken over Britney's life. And, uh, you know, Roger, I wish that you had represented her because Roger does such good work and he, he cares about his clients. And I think that so many people tried to steer Britney in the right direction when they felt she had taken the wrong turn by, by linking herself with this man who seemed to control her yeah. life and at the very same time seemed to destroy her career. And, and, and somebody like Roger could have hopefully helped to steer her in the right direction. Actually, Roger, I'd love to just bounce on that because I hear con man all the time. I think in this documentary, his own mom uses the quote, uh, he's economical with the truth. And his own brother repeatedly tells the filmmakers, oh, we're not the same person, we're not the same person. And then I learned that he actually like, spent her money like it was water and gave her fake jewelry. How much did he spend? Well, he went through $3 million of her money in three years. So he was going through a million dollars a year and he did have a facade that he was portraying. Uh, Brittany and her mom thought he was having jewelry made for them that was worth millions of dollars, that he was buying a property investments for them for the future. And it turned out after he passed away, um, and the dust settled. She wanted me to go, uh, her mom, Sharon, wanted me to go sell the jewelry. I took it to two Rodeo Drive uh, jewelry designers that I represent, and uh, both of them said the jewelry is all fake. The only thing real was the Cartier watch, and I had to take the jewelry back to her and watch her face as I told her that this was all fake, and then, she's, then she, it just hit her. And she said, I, well, I guess there's no land, I guess there's no homes, I guess there's no investments. And she was right. Wow. Uh, so, but you know, the thing about Simon, Ashley, is that uh, he, if you met him and sat and talked to him, a very smart man, he could sit down and play a piano, uh, he was a composer, a great photographer. The pictures he took of Britney were amazing, uh, but he had this other side to him uh, where he, he didn't play it straight. You know, he was sort of a con artist, and I just hate saying that because he was such, you sit and talk with him, he was such a nice man, but I could tell you this, they loved each other and they were soulmates, and I truly believe that. I don't believe 
that he wanted anything bad to happen to her. I just believe you can you can love somebody so much and overprotect them, and it could cost them their life. And I think that's what happened here. Ashley, well, con men are often known though. to be lovely. Yeah, but really quick, because i got to fit in a quick break, Jim. Just really quick comment. I, I, no, the, the, this other child, the, the mother of that child, said when she read that Brittany had married Simon, she thought, oh, my gosh, this is a woman who fell for the same man I did, and look what he did to me. He ghosted her after she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She never saw him after the baby was born, and he never saw that child. That is so de depressing. Just um, Okay, when we come back after the break, I want to talk about something that I found very upsetting, and that was the, the, the before and after of uh, Brittany Murphy. She was normal, uh, then she got skinny, then she got emaciated, and it turns out it's what a casting agent said to her that caused her to drop so much weight. We'll talk about that in a moment. Roger Neal and Jim Murray are back with me. Guys, I want to show you these two pictures side by side of Brittany Murphy before and after she started to lose so much weight because apparently a casting agent said to her, uh, you're not, and I'm going to use their word, uh, effable. You don't look effable. And so this is how she changed. I, and Roger, I just find this very sad. It's, I suppose it's not unique to Hollywood, but how did she seem as she was losing that weight? Uh, well, you know, uh many stars in Hollywood, there's a pressure on female stars a lot to look great and male stars to look great. So this is nothing unusual, I don't think, in Hollywood. Um, I think she took it a little too far. Uh, and then Simon, I think, also was a, was a force in her life that wanted her to even be thinner than she was because he really liked thin women. Mm -hmm. Very upsetting. And Jim Murray, yeah. I'm only going to flash some pictures in front of you to get an idea of those who die young and stay with us forever. Marilyn Monroe, Anna Nicole Smith, Judy Garland, Elvis, James Dean, Princess Di, and the 27 Club, including Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Amy Winehouse. These are people some of them phenomenal, some of them okay, but they just stayed with us. And you're in the business of this. Do you have any idea why we just can't shake them? Well, the, the, this group, enormously talented. And drugs is also another common denominator of this. But this group, and Brittany Murphy certainly among them, very talented, and that talent lasts. We see it in their records, in their, in their TV shows, in their films. And fortunately, we have that to remember them by. Yeah, and apparently very generous, too. Uh, an extraordinarily generous young woman. Everybody said that she, she was cast in Clueless because um, Brittany Murphy was, you know, uh, very authentic. And these people, they were authentic. Man, were they authentic. So maybe it's that authenticity. People who just were themselves and brought a uniqueness that just left, you know, an indelible mark. Hey, Jim Murray and Roger Neal, I um, want well, to thank you both. Really appreciate it. I, I, I encourage people to check out this doc because if you, you know, if you think you know everything about Brittany Murphy, I got news for you. So does HBO. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's been a busy week. Uh, so have a wonderful weekend. Uh, hold your loved ones close, you know? I think that's really important. Thank you for watching Banfield. I'll see you right back here on Monday.